got a bird's eye view into the what is called the standard model into the strong sector of the standard model. So, in the strong we saw that the uh, relevant gauge group was SU 3 color and this was a local gauge symmetry. Okay, and uh, so and this sort of implied that there were eight particles, spin one particles, or eight vector particles. It's called the gluons, and we saw that the hadrons. basically particles which feel the strong force were composed of quarks okay and we saw that the quarks which were in the fundamental of su 3 c Okay. So, these were the sort of uh, things and, uh, but we also saw something very nice, it was using an approximate symmetry which was if you had three quarks. Uh, there was an approximate symmetry which was an SU 3 flavor and we could we found that this was able to organize uh, mesons and baryons. Okay. But it turns out that there are many more quarks, more than just these three, and uh, so there we'll see that there are actually at least today we expect we have see that there are six kinds of quarks. which are organized into doublets of some SU2, which we will see in a short while. But I'm being a little bit uh, uh, what do you call imprecise, but that is ok. Um, this is just to give you charm and strange and top and bottom. So, there were 6 quarks and, uh, but uh, this is the most massive guy and the, uh, so, uh, the, this in some sense these become these are very massive and so, if you want to talk of uh, quarks. Uh, which are low energies uh, which uh, to construct the mesons at some. Uh, so, mesons were quark anti quark pairs. So, if you have a if you want to construct something which has a B B bar just to create a B B bar you require twice the mass of that thing. So, that is a very high energy object to create that. So, it is much easier. So, in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of masses these are lighter than this are lighter than this roughly speaking. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, SU 3 flavor is actually explicitly broken by the fact that these do not have the same masses for instance in an obvious manner. Okay. So, but, uh, but now you could say that you once you able to track mesons can we actually be clever and try to use uh, the fact that we know some masses for these guys and work backwards and uh, work out the, the. So, if you pick an octet for instance and you, you will find that because the masses are different you would expect that the octet uh, the mesons in an octet need not all, all have the same masses. Can we predict them in terms of some free parameters and in fact, this is a very very successful uh, way of proceeding the thing, but so the input would be just a few numbers like the masses of these particles plus some knowledge of the strong coupling strength. Okay. With these things you can actually have good estimates of their masses and it is a very, I mean you I would recommend that you look through it. It is a wonderful idea of, of looking at something for which you do not have a complete understanding of things, 
but nevertheless uh, you know from symmetry ground that there are these constraints etc you can put them in and you find that you can do a good job so there is no field theory necessary in some sense to do that okay so this is uh, so this is uh, one part of the standard model so we looked at hadrons and this is the only time i'm discussing fermions in this course okay so what happens is that there are, there, there are leptons and these are particles which don't feel the strong force but they feel other forces okay so for instance we saw that a, a neutron has some lifetime of around 15 15 minutes or something like that a free neutron it decays into you would have thought it should decay you know just based on charge conservation it can decay into a proton maybe an electron okay but uh, what people found is that uh, uh, this uh, there was some missing energy and then there was a puzzle should we think that you know uh, should we uh, think that conservation of energy is violated or something like that but it turns out that that's not true but uh, so and somebody was brave enough to predict a new particle called the i guess it's the bar anti electron neutrino okay so but all these so so the thing is that uh, yeah so so the thing is that you find that there are more particles etc and this is actually uh, the forces involved in this uh, correspond to something else and not these are not strong uh, because these do not feel any strong interactions these two particles uh, this should there should be something else which is doing this and that is uh, that sort of led to something called the weak force. Okay, it is a weak force relative to say you know uh, electromagnetism or something like that okay, so that is why we do not see it. So, also short ranged Okay. By the way, the strong sector, if you look at this, it, this does not explain why it is short ranged. Just writing this thing, it should be a perf it should uh, I mean it should be massless, etc. Okay. So, you might uh, one way of doing it is to say maybe there is some Higgs mechanism which would become make it massive, that is not the way it is going to happen. Okay. But that is exactly the way it is going to happen out here for the weak force, it will be short range because the, uh, the vector bosons pick up some mass. We will work out every b detail of this mechanism. In, uh, in the in this lecture, so it's short range, okay, and so the idea is to understand this force. But the key point here is that there are these particles, new uh, whole bunch of particles, like this. So you find that you have electrons, electron neutrinos, and their antiparticles. You also have what you f what people found is there was nu mu nu tau, and and tau nu tau. Okay, so these are all leptons. So these are exactly like the electron, but it's mass more massive, and this is also like this. It's more massive. So in some ways, it's sort of let me put them all together like this. Okay, there is a sense in which they are paired up again. Okay, and the 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 point is that now you see that there is a beautiful symmetry with the with the hadronic sector. I mean the quark sector and the the lepton sector. There are exactly three such things, three out here. Okay, so these sometimes they are called families. So this is called the U D E nu is the first family, C S nu mu nu can be one family, T B tau and nu tau. And uh, scientists are very clever and they try to look for some larger symmetries like S U five or something which would mix all of them together. And that and uh, that has some amount of success, but it has also the I don't think there is a given model. In, in some sense uh, as we will see in this uh, uh, towards the end of this lecture that uh, experiment lags behind theory okay, in some sense and today for instance the LHC is verifying stuff which is known from now ages. Okay. So, <coughs> so, so what you find is these are the kind of leptons that you have and uh, so these are again I have written something as doublet but there is a technicality involved I mean uh, in the sense that. Uh, uh, one usually uh, breaks up electrons into left movers and right movers and one only one of them pairs up with the neutrinos in the standard model but again things have changed from from interesting sources for instance the sun is known to uh, be a good source of neutrinos okay 
and uh, we understand uh, how the reactions of the uh, of the, uh, in the in the core of the sun rather well and so we so there is a prediction theoretical prediction based on you know things like normal uh, reactions in the lab because you don't think uh, that the reactions in inside the sun are going to be any different from what we do in the lab because it's the same material same substance so cross sections will be the same uh, uh, decay rates will be the same etc so you can predict how much how many neutrinos you should see in the lab but it turns out that uh, uh, that uh, the number of neutrinos we see are, is very small okay by the way neutrinos are really extremely weak i mean yeah, they can just uh, by and large it's very easy for them to just go through the whole earth without interacting with anything so you can see they are very very hard to detect and so they were really detected the first time around as a missing mass and you uh, you sort of say that there is this particle so these are very very light particles so the original guess was they were massless and chiral in the sense that they were only something called left movers but there were no right movers okay or vice versa it depends on i don't know what the convention is but that's not relevant so coming back to what i wanted to say is that uh, so neutrinos are very hard to detect and uh, i just lost the thread of what i wanted to say uh, okay so what we will see today is to understand a little bit more about the weak force and how these uh, become short ranged okay so uh, so this is called the electro weak symmetry breaking okay and uh, the group uh, the relevant gauge group is going to be su2 weak called u1y times with the subscript y this u1 is not supposed to be the electromagnetic u1 okay so the gauge so so these are there is a local gauge symmetry and uh, yeah now i remember what i wanted to say what i wanted to say is that these doublet doublets have to do with only one set of movers if they were exactly massless okay but uh, the thing is that the, today we know from experiments so the solar neutrino puzzle we saw the, that the number of neutrinos we observed was less there's also another thing called the atmospheric neutrinos or the uh, okay so both of these uh, things there were some puzzles which we knew how to resolve the res i mean the resolution involved giving masses to the neutrinos but rather small okay so there are plenty of bounds on what the total masses of all these particles can be and they are of i mean it's rather small okay it's of the order of ev i think okay for instance the neutrino mass etc so for instance the solar neutrino puzzle is resolved by saying that uh, some of them get flare converted to some other flavor i don't work in this area so i don't know the nitty gritty details of that it's been many years since i looked at it so but uh, the key point is that we as theorists we understand how to handle all these guys even if they have little masses we know how to do them but the reality is that uh, nature you should know what nature chooses okay and so this is a very theoretical course so we, we we will just look at mechanisms and we need to prove okay that this mechanism is indeed done. okay so now we see that the so called standard model has three local gauge symmetries one is su3c the other two are these su2 and u1 so in, in principle what one has in mind is if you go at very very high energy energy scales all these symmetries which are hidden or broken uh, will will become obvious okay so what happens here is that the symmetry breaking mechanism is that this combination is broken down to u1 em okay so now let's just do some counting su3 has 3 gauge bosons u1 will have 4 and uh, the, so what we will see is that this is uh, so the higgs mechanism will give masses to 3 of the 4 and will leave only one thing which is massless and that uh, combination is what we should call the electromagnetism because that we know that we, we are able i mean even at lower energies we do see a photon which to to a great accuracy has zero mass okay so so let us understand how this works and so it works in a uh, in, in the in some ways this is the simplest way of doing it there are many other ways of doing it so uh, 
So, what we do is we consider a complex uh, SU 2 doublet. Okay. So, here all these guys you know all these doublets which I have written are doublets of this SU 2. Okay. And roughly it will look like uh, so the generator should look like T 1 T 2 T 3 which we used. So, to uh, approximation this there was an SU 2 subgroup sitting inside this SU 2 flavor that roughly has is related to this we will see a little bit more. Okay. And then instead of calling it phi 1 and phi 2 I call it phi plus and phi 0. Okay, it is a doublet, so it is a SU 2 doublet and the U 1 is just the diagonal. Okay, U 1 is just act same on this thing, so, uh, so I will just write the transformation, it is best written that way. Phi prime will be transforming as E power i theta a T a plus uh, i by 2 maybe some angle alpha times y acting on y, where T a is just the Pauli matrices half of the Pauli matrices it is just the state. So, this theta a's are the uh, SU 2 transformations and this is just alpha is the uh, U 1 transformation y is just the identity matrix. So, that is like saying that the y charge of phi, phi and phi plus and phi, phi 0 is 1 is plus 1 okay. and this half is. Uh, so, this is just to fit certain notations y is sometimes called the weak hypercharge I just call it the hypercharge. Okay. I do not have freedom in, uh, in these definitions because these are standard. Okay. So, I have given you the transformation. So, you can see this is just a statement that it transforms like a doublet under this SU 2 and this just says that it is the diagonal part. Yes. No, 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 they will become the U 1 charges, U 1 under electromagnetism. Again, it is not this U 1, but uh, yeah, it is not this U 1 y that is what I am saying. Uh, the U 1 charges are plus 1 plus 1. If you or if you want to put this half into that you can say half half. Okay. So, now we just need to so, so this is just uh, you go ahead and make this into a local gate symmetry and you write out this thing. So, Lagrangian would be Okay, and <coughs> and then so this is what we would put, and so let me just do one more thing. We can also uh, put uh, kinetic energies for these two things. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll call the field strength for this. I'll call it g mu nu a, and for this I'll call it f mu nu a. Okay, so. minus one fourth okay. and uh, where I need to define a whole bunch of things d mu of phi is a covariant derivative with respect to all these things. So, it would be d mu of phi uh, let me pull the phi out minus i. Okay, so, note that I have not put the coupling constant here, I rescale things. So, I will get it, I will get them out here. So, I will introduce two coupling constants little g for this and little g prime for this. g times uh,
Okay. So I need to use the. If you remember for the U1 case, I mentioned that you can see that the charges matrix of charges would look like a T. So this is just that. So Y and T have similar roles out here. So this is just that. So W mu is the. Uh, these three are the gauge bosons or gauge fields for SU2, and this will be the gauge field. for u 1 y. So, they are just local. So, this is so far nothing it is just carrying over whatever we did for uh, non abelian gauge theories out here and this for the abelian gauge theory just putting them together. Okay. Next thing is to just define these things these you had worked out in an assignment. So, let me do the easy one first. Any question? Is there anybody with a question? Okay, so this is the piece, but this is a non abelian gauge field, so we will get some extra pieces out here. So F A B C, which would be in this case epsilon A B C, uh, W nu mu nu. Doesn't matter, but okay. I'm not hundred percent sure about the sign here. Okay, but it's this is what you should get. Okay, so just remember that uh, the G comes here because think about it uh, when you what did you do you wherever you saw w you put g w okay so you would have written a g w here g w here but this is w square so we'll get a g square one you can pull out and that will cancel the g square out here so yeah, but there will be this thing this is a very important way of writing it because what we are doing here is writing the kinetic energy in standard form okay and this g here is really the coupling Okay, so, what you would do in perturbation theory is to expand things out and uh, work with G, uh, G as a small object and you do computations. Okay. So, so this is actually much more tailored to computations etcetera. So, if you want to fix masses etcetera this is the way to do it because otherwise the, you would be missing factors of G in the mass even though we are in 3 plus 1 dimensions and G is dimensionless it is still a number. Okay, and so you need to keep track of that. So that covers all these things. I just need to. Uh, what is it we uh, we need about u? We just need u is uh, something such that uh, it has a uh, minimum at a non-trivial value of phi, which is phi not equal to zero. Okay, we could choose my favorite potential or the only potential that I seem to know to make that work, but actually that's not very relevant. Okay, and so. I am not going to say that, I will just say that uh, uh, the thing is minimized by some value where I will write out what phi should be. Okay. Are there a, just ask me questions if there are any terms in there you do not understand or so far it is actually straight ahead. Okay. So, what we do is so let us say that the, the symmetry breaking minimum is given by saying phi equal to 0 and some number a and we choose a to be real. Okay. So, this is what we do and once we add, so this is what we would have done if you are writing the vacuum solution for that particular u. So, a is determined of course, by the minimum uh, the, the region where you can see that that implies phi dagger a is a square. Okay, so, the minimum occurs at say phi dagger phi equal to a square, this is real.
okay so so the thing is that once we turn on gauge fields the minimum the, this vacuum solution would be a solution with w and a also being zero this is something we have seen again okay so now what we have to do is to uh, to get the masses we have to write out fluctuations and we could be clever right so write out to get masses okay first thing is that uh, so first let us uh, understand the unbroken symmetry so i have to show that you get a u1 what is the unbroken symmetry okay so so the unbroken symmetry would be given by the one which would act on g of a and give you back 0 a where g is some combination of these guys yes thank you the reason i am not using mu is because we will uh, I, I think for once i will use mu for the electromagnetism okay so so we need to do this but this looks very complicated to solve but we can solve it in a very simple manner we just need to see that the g is just this kind of element this is a typical element you act on that and uh, so all you need to do is to ask what is the linear combinations of uh, of uh, t and y which acts on this which goes to this okay so you just it's easy to see that uh, so suffices to to consider is this advantage of uh, 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 to find the elements of the lie algebra which on which, which annihilate this because g is 1 plus something so this is the one so you can say this is g minus 1 equal to 0 so you want to and you expand it out so it's better to think of this as g minus identity of 0 a equal to 0 okay so we just need to look at this thing and it's very easy to see that t plus t minus will not work or t1 t2 will not do it but uh, neither will t3 neither will y but a linear combination and that combination is very easy to write it is this combination in terms of matrices t3 is half minus half so this will become 1 and a 0 okay and trivially it annihilates this okay so this is the unbroken linear combination in terms of the lie algebra generators and no other combination all the others are this thing so this is the unbroken so in other words g e power whatever right you put these things you choose theta 3 to be equal to so so what do i mean by that g which is equal to e power some i alpha into t3 plus half y will do the job will be an invariance of this thing so this proves that uh, so we get uh, that there is a u1 which is unbroken so so you can see that uh, the advantage of having a lie algebra is the symmetry breaking even checking for symmetry breaking is reduced to some actually if, uh, finding out uh, the it is just a problem in linear algebra more like it is enough to do for small elements and then you are done and by exponentiation I get the most general element. So, from general things which we have seen so we expect so for global case global case global symmetry what is it uh, we have how many Goldstone bosons should we expect. So, we have S u 2 mod u 1 times u 1 broken to u 1 we will have 3 because dimension. So, so this is 3 plus 1 is 4 and dimension of g h which is u 1 e and m is equal to 1. So, you subtract these two you get 3 Goldstone bosons. Okay, and uh, the Higgs mechanism will tell you that these Goldstone bosons will pro three Goldstone bosons will give masses to three of these linear combinations, and one of them will remain massless. 
that massless guy we will identify it with electromagnetic cage field. Okay. So, now we need to do we need to put meat onto this we have to we know what to expect, but we have to put numbers and see what we get. So, just me let, let me remind you. So, first step would be to do fluctuations to get the masses we have to consider fluctuations okay. and uh, so we can see that uh, uh, in the local so you would write phi prime phi as some e power write the most general group element e power i theta a t a plus i alpha uh, instead of that I can actually say that I should get the other combination or something like that. Okay. Acting on 0 a plus some eta. Okay, first point is that there are not four parameters here because one con linear combination that is this combination annihilates everything. So I should remove. In fact, I I don't need to. So I can just get rid of. In that sense, I can just get rid of this y. I can trade it and rewrite it in this terms. Okay. So, but the point is that so these fluctuations. So you can see I have exactly four fluctuations. Okay, and in the local thing we can shift this and get rid of this. So, can choose a gauge. where this fluctuation goes away. Okay, so, we will just write, so we will write the phi as 0 a and eta is some real guy. So, it is eta is a real fluctuation and of course, there is the gauge field. So, there is w mu a and b mu. Okay. So, they were originally 0. So, I do not need to 0 plus something I just call whatever I get as the fluctuations. Okay. It is fluctuations plus this gauge transformation part which to remove that get rid of that. So, this is what we get. So, the first thing is to realize is that now, uh, so I can I can drop this piece in the gauge. So, I just need you can see that to leading order this uh, phi here is just 0 a plus eta what I will do is I will do it in two steps, I will forget about eta, we will do the eta masses later. So, we will just put 0 a. Okay. So, we will compute, so then this term if you look out here, uh, the d mu on some constant, a is a constant, so this vanishes. So, this will just give you these kind of terms. Okay. So, let us just go ahead and play with it a bit, I can erase this. Okay. So, so, what I am going to do now is I want to work out what is d mu of 0 a. In principle I can do it with a plus eta, but I do not want to do it for now. Okay. So, what is this we need to work out, but this is nothing but the de derivative acting on this is 0. If I put the eta it will give me a d mu of eta. Okay. So, that will be minus i g Okay, and T s where half sigma is, so we can just I can work out what G W mu a T a acting on zero a will be. Okay, this is just half of Pauli sigma matrices, so I can just pull that out half G into uh, again this was this expression was there in your assignment previous assignment, so you get something like. Okay, and let me just call this combination w, w mu plus. Okay, if I wanted to do things, I should put root twos, etc. So when I look at the mass term, I will remember that. Okay, so at this point, I'll just leave it as is. So this is just what I'll call w mu plus. So this is equal to half g into a. So I can even pull out this a 
I get W mu plus here and this term will give me minus that is this piece, first piece. I am pulling out a minus i and uh, next one will be is a lot easier. It is just g prime over 2 into y, which is just di uh, yeah, into 0. I am just jumping steps here. That is this piece because y is a diagonal matrix. So, any diagonal matrix multiplying 0 a is this, I pull out the a, this is what I get. So, you can see that if I add, I just need to add these two things and multiply by minus i, I get what I need. So, I get d mu of 0 a is equal to we can keep the halves outside. So, I can write g a Even the A I can pull out G okay. this is what I get. You can see that only one linear combination of W mu 3 and B mu is coming out here. Okay. Uh, there is an I minus i which will disappear. So, what I have to do is mod square of this minus i will go off. Important thing is w mu the plus will become star of that is w mu minus. Okay, so, we just work out what we get for this. So, what we get is a square by 8 into uh, that is this piece. Why did I do this 8? Oh, there was half from this. Okay. Is there any half I have forgotten anywhere? No, I have not. Good. No, I just do not want to mess up. <laughs> that is all. Uh, minus What? Is there a half or a, I mean I cannot see what I have there. Half half, half okay, I am okay. I am perfectly fine. So this is what I got. Okay. So this I will equate to the following. Why am I using capital M? I have no idea. Let us use small m like we did n w square. Oh, yeah, it does not matter. Okay. You are correct for that. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I mean, legally speaking, that is uh, required. So, I am correcting it, correcting it out here. Okay. And then here, what do we see? So, this I would like to be half. I will define something called m z. Okay, I have not defined a whole bunch of things I have to define. Only thing I have defined is w mu plus and w mu minus. I do not put a half here because uh, uh, of the reason that, why is that? Yeah, because this I should have a root 2 in the definition to get it correct. And so, what is z is, is actually nice, it is just more or less that combination. But I have to sort of make it a okay so just comparing things we see that m so z is so so what we have is three bosons call them w mu plus 
w mu minus and uh, z these pick up masses the mass for the w's square is just just by comparing is uh, upon h and then m z square So, m z square will have this thing now ok. I am little bit unsure about this, this could be 4 and 2 depends on the convention, there are some conventions so which I which are offhand I do not remember, but what you can see here is that this is a concrete thing that you see ok. And I forgot to mention that there was a combination which the unbroken combination these are the charges. So, we will define q we will define it to be T 3 plus half y. Do you see anything familiar in this? What was that? Gelman Nishijima relation ok. So, now going back to the original definition of phi you can check that uh, the first one. So, this may this is exactly which was 1 and 0 which says that the guy below has 0 charge and the upper guy has charge 1 ok. So, this so this q is nothing but the electromagnetic charge ok. So, we just need to work out what is the combination which is uh, which becomes a mu and that is easy to see a mu is just the orthogonal combination to this and I think you just should exchange g and g prime and change a sign here. Okay, so, g prime ok. The angle is nothing but, so now this also you can uh, it is easy to see that uh, the uh, w mu plus and minus will have no uh, y uh, charge. So, T 3 eigenvalues which is what they are plus and minus. So, the plus fellow will have char electromagnetic charge plus 1 and this will have charge plus minus 1 and this will have charge 0 because it commutes it comes from the T 3 and y sector ok. So, so this uh, this uh, this whole thing says that you should find uh, two uh, uh, two charge uh, charged under u 1 uh, bosons with masses given by this and uh, you also get some uh, you get uh, another vector boson which is chargeless which has this ok. So, usually it is this is written z 0 and this could be w plus and minus ok. So, the the angle tan theta w is defined to be g prime over g. Let me just check this I do not want to write some wrong formula yeah. Okay. So, you can see that we can write uh, this would imply that sin theta w is uh, so this sin theta upon cos theta. So, this is of the same. So, you can see that this is this for instance is my minus cosine theta w w mu 3 and this thing. So, it is just a rotation uh, by an angle theta w in this space of uh, b mu and e ok and this is the photon who, which does not appear in, in the masses. So, this is massless ok. Now, you see that this relation is what I had in mind when I said you know it looks uh, so there is nothing wrong with thinking of this T 3 as related to the other the the T 3 we saw in the flavor thing etcetera ok and it does not mess up anything because u and d sit in a doublet of this thing ok. So, we can look at numbers and the numbers are nice m w is a 80 g v m z is around 91 point something ok. Let me leave it at that 91 g v and sin square theta w is around 0 
So, these are experimentally measured things. So, you could uh, turn things around and see that these are. So, you can see that what are what are our observables? Our observables are the masses of m w and m z, these are things which we observe. Okay. And then you can you can see that for instance, uh, what can we see m w by m z square, uh, the ratio of them will be g square by this thing. So, that would be sin square theta w. Okay. So, so now you can see that the experimentally observed things really fit into this thing and it really fits this pattern. Okay. So, this goes by the name of Lasho Weinberg Salam model. And I must tell you, these models were proposed, the, the SU2 cross U1, certain parts of it was proposed well before the Higgs mechanism was known. Okay. And it took, I, I suspect it took, it was the early 60s, I think, it took enormous courage on their part to, and people did not even know if the quantum theory was good. Okay, so, very brave people. Okay, so, but now there is still one more guy whose mass we have to figure out, and that is the eta. So, now I will look at so so this will give you one bunch of term, this will give you half of that, will give you d mu of eta whole square. Okay, plus maybe interactions, etcetera, plus other plus more terms, higher order pieces, but this will give the kinetic energy piece, and then there will be pieces with, with eta with the gauge bosons. These are interactions in a field theory sense. But now, what does this give you? So here we will see that you will get u. What is what would phi dagger phi be? It would be a plus eta whole square. Okay. So, now we have to expand this to second order in eta. So, this will be equal to some u at a plus uh, uh, the first order piece will go off and then you will end up. So, you need to take a second order derivative of this. Evaluated at whatever you know, phi equal to with a half, maybe. Okay. So now, so this is the part. So so far, I mean, all these things did not involve. It only involved the value of the vacuum expectation value, this thing, and we didn't need anything, any details of the potential. But now we need the curvature of the potential at that thing and that tells you the mass of the eta square. Okay, so, the prediction is of this if this model is correct the prediction is there is a massless scalar particle corresponding to eta. Okay, this particle is called the Higgs. Okay. And a lot of money is being spent at LHC to actually find this particle, but you can see that there is no way the uh, this data that we have the fact that we have observed all these particles we know these things I am giving you precise numbers that will give uh, you can work things around and you can get for me what A is, but that is not going to help you fix the mass of this particle because this depends on something else. So, you can go ahead and put that lambda phi 4 kind of theory that thing which I write lambda mod phi square minus a square whole square expand it and you will find that it depends on lambda and lambda is not fixed by anything. So, there is no prediction you can make for this mass. Okay. So, now people have other ways of putting constraints observe uh, uh, these things and so that comes from experiments, but theoretically there is no way we can predict it. This, this is a serious problem, I mean you do not know is it low, is it high, I mean these are the kind of things. And uh, in fact, recently in the news I saw uh, a sort of uh, the possible masses where in fact, I think the Fermi lab people ruled out some segment and it was some bang in the middle of somewhere. 
So, there are a range of masses I think 100 to 200 GeV where you know somewhere in between it is. So, the, the open question is is it a light, is it below that range, is it above that range, these mean different things. Okay. And so, we so far we have never observed a fundamental particle which is scalar, we have observed lot of scalar particles, pions are examples of that, but they are not fundamental, they, they we know that they are made up of quarks, but we have not seen a single scalar particle, a, a, a fundamental particle and so in some sense this is a holy grail. And maybe, maybe that is why it is called the God particle. Okay. Yeah, done. So, I answered my own question.